Hey, welcome. Hey, today we have the pleasure of introducing you to Aaron Kelsey from EHRA, headquartered here in Houston. And we're going to discuss today and dive into the intriguing topic of utilizing LiDAR technology on your construction site, even when you're faced with diverse levels of vegetation. So Aaron has something special in store for us today, and he's going to share some of the intriguing, uh, insightful data and engaging in some kind of conversations around some of the hurdles and advantages associated with incorporating LiDAR into urban development projects. And by the way, stick around because Aaron is also going to unveil how LiDAR vegetation analysis is revolutionizing your construction or engineering business. This is going to be awesome. All right, here we go. So Aaron, do you have a project uh, that you'd like to showcase that shows how you're using LiDAR and, and how it's making a difference? Absolutely, yeah. So we, uh, we have this one here that we flew. Uh, this one was called New Age. Uh, I don't remember why it was called New Age. A lot of times our projects either get named uh, based upon uh, the owner of the property or the developer or uh, what the subdivision is going to be called, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. the abstract survey. I mean, there, there, there's different reasons why they get named different names. Uh, but this one was called New Age. Uh, this was in Conroe. And uh, this was one, uh, it, was, it was challenging because uh, it has multiple different types of terrain here. So you've got heavily wooded area to the west and the east. You've got, uh, you know, the, the area in the center there. It was also challenging because there was an airport really close by. So our, uh, our ceiling yeah. was limited to uh, about 150 feet. Um, and uh, okay. so we flew this one. This one took about, I think it took right around two hours to fly it in total. Uh, and that's where the 300 foot uh, Yes. To, well, it would be it would be up about 400 yeah. foot total side to side. So 200 from the drone uh, left and then 200 to the right. So 400 total. Right. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. I, I, was, I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. So this would have been 300 feet, 300 foot swath. Yeah. yeah again, it, we, so we have, we have, you know, a so standard flight height we typically swath. fly at. Nice. And this one was... Uh, definitely not standard. When I see you have a lot of vegetation here, did, what did you have to change to get, you know, to get good penetration on this thing? So when it comes to vegetation, you've got you've got different options. Um, you can either do you can do one of two things, or you can you can do both of them at the same time. You can either slow the drone down. Right. So when you slow down your airframe, uh, you're going to be getting additional points because you don't change your calculation for your lines per second at that time. Right. Um, it's still going to continue to do whatever it is, 42, 44 lines per second. You're just flying it now at a slower speed, so you're getting a lot more uh, point density in the vegetation. So what you're really looking at, Aaron, is like if you're flying regularly at, what, uh, 16 meters or 16 feet per second or something like that, you're getting something like this kind of spacing. And then if you're slowing down to 12 or 8 feet per second, you're kind of narrowing that down. So that separation Correct. from line to line are getting a lot better. Yes, uh, and then... The other thing you could do is you can fly closer to the canopy. Um, if if that's something that someone decides they want to do, uh, my suggestion would be to uh, you want to use a recon drone first. Uh, we always do that. We we have a little uh, little recon drone, little camera drone we put out. Yeah, ex yeah, that's what we call it. Is our sacrificial drone. Sacrificial if, drone. if one's going down, it's <laughs> going to be that one. We're not we're not going to. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. So, uh, you know, you put that up and then done. usually what you'll do is I'll, I will <laughs> yes. fly around and I'll try to find the tallest tree out there. And then I'm going to set my height to be about 10 to 15 feet above that. Um, just a little bit of a buffer in case, uh, you know, do those two things. You can either fly slower, fly closer to the canopy, or you can do both of those and you can fly closer to the canopy yeah. and slower and you'll get maximum point density then under the canopy. Nice. Aaron, what are the biggest challenges of working in, in such dense vegetation? It, it's, that's usually the biggest challenge is uh, getting the point density that you're looking for. And then usually there's a lot of questions about the data that you collected. And so we just have to prove it up by going out and collecting ground control points and ensuring that uh, our data all matches up correctly. Why do people have questions about your, your data? Uh, you know, it's, it's, LiDAR is still kind of new to a lot of people. Um, and so you've seen this, there's been this, this evolution in surveying where, uh, there was, you know, an older group who all they ever used was a transit. 
and 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 a transit is uh i'm sure you've seen them it's it's just a little little looking glass it's got the plumb bob that comes down and then guys pull chain that's how they used to do it um, they don't do it that way anymore and so they went from that to total station i started my survey career with this it takes forever oh, okay yeah it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. Throwing chain takes forever. Yeah. And it's a pain if you got a guy on the other end who works out a lot and he starts yanking that chain on you. But then they went from that to total station and uh, total station. All that did was got rid of the need to pull chain um, and it electronically stores all of your angles. And then they went from total station to GPS. And this is all happened in, in a relatively quick period, actually, uh, from total station to GPS. Uh, and there was a lot of people that questioned. I'm going to talk about this because it's about the time whenever I got into surveying. Uh, there's a lot of people that question the accuracy of GPS. There's a lot of people that still question the accuracy of GPS. And it's been around for, uh, you know, a lot. It's been around for 30 years, at least. It's been used in surveying for close to 30 years at this point. And uh, people question the accuracy of that. So they didn't want to use it for anything. They, they're used to the old way of doing things. That's That's what we're going to do. Um, and so th that's really what you're seeing is you're just seeing a lot of holdover where people, uh, they, they, they don't understand the technology. Um, and because they don't understand it, there, there's a lot of questioning. Um, so it's, it's, it's pertinent. It's very important for us, the, the people who are collecting the data to be able to prove to people that question and doubt that the data that we're getting is, um, accurate, it's repeatable, um, and that we're, we're giving them, more data than they would have previously gotten, and we're giving them more accurate data than they would have previously gotten. Well, hey, Aaron, do you have an overlay of what that data would look like? Because right now these guys are looking at a, at a video, or not a video, but a picture, you know, but let's show them the power of what this thing has. Absolutely, yeah. So this, this would be, uh, this was just a, an example of, uh, the amount of data that you collect. So you can see here, this is actually a solid surface model that was created from some of the data that we collected. And um, right. you can see tire tracks in there. You can see an area where there's a culvert going under the road. Um, I've been able to see uh, dozer tracks. Uh, you can see all kinds of data. This is in the open area. And, and just for our viewers here, this is raw. This hasn't been processed or cleaned up. This this is just bare earth return. This is this is well. This was processed. These are ground only points, um, but okay, this that. is uh, you're still talking about millions of points that were on this site. But what I'm saying is, you didn't smooth it. You didn't do any of the other. You didn't decimate it or take anything out of it. This is nope. You... No, there's. This is 100% raw ground points, correct? Yes. Yeah, so we didn't, um, usually what we do is we end up thinning it out. Uh, Bullneck is a computer that can uh, process that much data. So, but then. Well, that and the ground truthing from your engineers is that it could be so much that they don't know correct. how to use it. So a lot of folks will decimate it just to make it easy for A, to process it, but also so they correct. can get their head around yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is this is the uh, the completed data uh, for the entire site uh, overlaid on the aerial. Nice. Uh, so mm -hmm. you can see the the area that's in the the purple and magenta up there. Uh, that was the highest point on the site, and then going down to the blue, and it starts going back into purple then again because uh, it cycles through colors. Uh, that's the lowest point on the site. And I noticed you captured outside of your boundary, big time in some places. Correct. Why would you do that? Yeah, uh, well, so the area that was north was actually an area of interest for them, uh, and it was because of this tributary here. And so they asked us to fly that area up there as well. Uh, even though it was outside of the boundary, they asked us to fly that up there because it. a lot of times we do that where, uh, with a uh, uh, like a drainage study. So if we're doing a drainage study on an area, we'll fly outside. We'll typically fly along like a drainage canal or something like that so the engineers can see um, how much volume is in that canal. Which direction is it going? Uh, things like that. This is a uh, this is that zoomed in on that tributary oh, that's off in the that. woods. Um, so you can you can see all the little little bitty fingers that it picks up. Uh, and this is data that would not be picked up by a field crew traditionally. Uh, they would have just collected the data every 100 feet, and that's you don't know if they're going to hit that tributary perpendicular to it 
are they going to just go across it? Are they going to miss, uh, you know, they could end up missing one of those little fingers there. I mean, there's a lot that gets missed in the woods. When you're just walking through, uh, it's Texas, so it's hot. A lot of times you're like, I, you know. Just want to get it done. I didn't see it. Yeah. You know, I was just walking through it. I tripped. You know, there was a snake. There was whatever. Oh, jeez. So, yeah, you deal with a lot. And so little things like that can get missed, and they do get missed. But the LiDAR doesn't miss it. How much easier has this made you a job? So much easier. Um, so much easier in the sense that, that, uh, there's not a, for a couple of reasons, it, it's, it makes it easier in the sense that we get a lot of data. Um, so it makes it to where the, uh, engineers, they have all the data that they need. Um, and then the other thing too, a lot of times you'll have people that question you, particularly contractors question the, you know, your methods, they question, mm -hmm. you know, dirt, dirt is always a big issue. Um, so they want you to come out and, and resurvey it. And a lot of times if we show up with a big rig like that, we show up with a drone with a LIDAR unit on it, they kind of look at it and they're like, okay, these guys are serious. Like they're not out here with just a stick. They're, they're flying a drone around. So it, 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 you're taking a lot more seriously then. Right on. I mean, have you had to have people come in behind this and prove Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what, yes. what would that look like? <laughs> Tell uh, about that. <laughs> well, they did it on this one. Uh, they did it on this one here, and they uh, they paid a field crew to go out and collect data on this. It took the field crew about two weeks, um, and uh, again, I think that probably cost them probably close to twenty thousand dollars or so. Uh, now, was that the whole site, or was it what just we're looking at here just the, the tributary time? area? Yeah, that's they were questioning the volume of the tributary wow. there. And there was only about a right. 25 yard difference between what the field crew collected and what we collected with the LIDAR. Um, we had another one recently where there was a construction crew that was uh, questioning our, our dirt calculations. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember, it was like 3,000 feet difference or something. It was significant. They were questioning. It was a pretty, pretty significant difference. And uh, so we went out and flew it, and uh, uh, they, they were wrong. Uh, and and a, a, another reason why another reason why the lidar is uh, superior is it's it's there's nothing subjective about it. Um, it's just shooting out points and then getting the information back. Whereas previously with a, a traditional terrestrial crew, I may I may go look at a point and say, okay, this looks like the top of bank of the ditch to me, and then someone could come behind me and look, and mm -hmm. their top of bank is a foot to the left or foot to the right or, or, you know, further than that. And so it's up for interpretation. Whereas with LIDAR, there's no interpretation. It's, it's spraying out all these points and it's coming back. And so it's up for interpretation. Whereas with LIDAR, there's no interpretation. It's, it's spraying out all these points and it's coming back and you're allowing the computer to decide for you. So there's, it's, it's not objective at all. Um, I'm sorry. It's, it's not subjective at all. Well, it's, it's a remote, yeah, it's it's a reality capture. So you have that relative accuracy that can't be correct, can't be refuted. Yeah. Well, Aaron, it's Phoenix's tenth anniversary this year, and you're clearly a big fan. Um, but I just wondered if you had a message for them. Yeah, I would just say keep doing what you're doing. Um, I, I'm I'm very happy with their product. Uh, their product speaks for itself. The people are fantastic. Uh, you know, shout out to Grayson. He's uh, he's built a great company and uh, the people there are great. The product is great. The service is great. Uh, we will be buying another Phoenix LiDAR uh, before long here for sure. And uh, anybody who asks, I tell them if, if you want the best LiDAR in the industry, you got to go get a Phoenix. That's fantastic. And Aaron, if anybody wants to get hold of you, how can they do that? Uh, so they can go look at our website if they'd like, just to do some recon. It's ehra.team, e ehra team, or they can call us at 713-784-4500. Perfect. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you all.